increasing by the Word of God. So today, our faith will increase, our faith will grow, because we're hearing the Word of God. Now, we know it's just also true that fear comes by hearing what the devil has to say. If faith comes by hearing God's Word, then fear comes by listening to the devil. So the level of your faith or your level of fear depends on who you're listening to. Oh, I got one little amen. There was a few others there. But it's the truth. I believe we need to hear the Word of God more than what the world is speaking. Who chooses what we're hearing? We do. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we open up your Holy Word We believe for your Holy Spirit to speak to our lives. And Father God, we know that just hearing something is not enough. In Jesus' parable about the sower sowing the Word, the Word went on so many different types of ground. It went by the wayside. It it went on stony, rocky, rocky ground. It went on thorny ground. It went also on good ground. The only place that brought production, that brought life and brought Uh, nourishment, Lord, that really brought change was good ground. So we pray, Father God, that your word will fall upon good ground and we will continue to let that word, that seed stay in the ground, water it, and we declare we shall see an abundant harvest. We shall see uh, God glorified in our lives because the word will work, the the word will produce In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, many times, not all times, but many times when we start a service, I I share a little story. You know, I I, I believe it's it's a good thing to laugh. It's a a good thing to... um, It's something about opening up our heart and opening up our spirit. You know, laughter does good like a medicine, so receive some good medicine this morning. By the way, we welcome our internet audience. This is Sunday, uh, July, what is it, 19th? 19th, 2015, so we're glad that we, uh, we have people watching us. I believe we have some people watching us live. And in fact, Margaret, if you're watching us, happy birthday. You got a birthday, I believe, uh, coming up. When is that birthday? Is it tomorrow? I thought so. Margaret, we won't say how old you are. Praise God. <laughs> we love you, sister, and love all of you that are watching. We have people that watch us uh, on, on other sides of the world. Um, some people just pull up anytime they want to. And just think about it. You can turn me on anytime, day or night. Anytime, day or night, you can turn and hear preaching of the Word of God. Amen. Just get on your computer. We have it archived. And uh, praise God. All right. A census taker walked up to a woman who was sitting on a porch. After introducing himself, he said, How many children do you have? The woman answered, Four. The census taker asked, May I have their names, please? The woman replied, Eeny, meeny, miny, and... George, confused, the census taker said, may I ask why you named your fourth child George? Surely, because we didn't want any more. Because we didn't want any more. (laughs) I love it. Praise God. And for, for us folks, you know, we're the blab it and grab it group. We're the name it and claim it group. You know, hey, this, this has significance. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, open your Bibles, please, if you will, to the book of Second Chronicles. We will be going to chapter number uh, 12 of Second Chronicles in your Old Testament. And the title of our message today, Is It Brass or Gold? Is It Brass or Gold? Here in this time of the history of the children of Israel, we know that um, God brought His people out of Egypt, brought them out of bondage, brought them into His own land, and uh, for a 
for a period of time, they were um, ruled over by, by judges and so forth. But there came a time that they wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to fit in, so they asked God for a king. God told them, that's not my best. But they persisted and persisted, and so finally they got a king. Well, uh, that king, Saul, was the first king of Israel. After Saul, who was the next king? Someone help me. David. David was the next king. And in David's heart was a place, a desire to build a house for God. And so he was a part of accumulating uh, what was necessary to, to do it, but because of uh, the blood that was on his hands, because he, uh, he was a warrior, uh, God didn't allow him to build that house, but his son did, the next king. And who was that? Solomon. And so we know in Jerusalem there on that temple mount, the very spot where Abraham offered up his son Isaac, on that altar, um, that is the very place that Solomon built the first temple. Before that, we know the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, dwelt in tents in what is called, was called the tabernacle. While Israel was wandering around the desert before they got into the promised land, they carried around that Ark of the Covenant and put it in that tent uh, called the tabernacle. But then that we know the temple was dedicated, the presence of God filled that place, and that was the place that, that they worshipped. Well, then after uh, Solomon, and, and we know that uh, Solomon was the wisest man on the earth, he was uh, a wealthiest man on earth, but towards the end of his kingdom he began to slip and fall away from God. Well, he did die, he did pass, and then his son uh, took over, Rehoboam, uh, after him. And so we're going to talk today about Rehoboam. Rehoboam was, again, Solomon's son, who took over. In fact, in verse 17 of, of the chapter 11, it said, uh, So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So for the first three years of his rule, he did good things as far as the leading people towards God instead of away from God. Do you know our leaders are important? What they stand for, what they believe for, affects the whole nation. You wouldn't think that one person, one man could make such a difference, but it really does. By the way, let me give you an example. Remember President Clinton? And you remember what happened in the White House under his desk? In the Oval Office? Well, that, that thing, that affected the whole nation. Infected the whole nation with that that kind of sexual activity. I mean, it just, it just opened up a floodgate. Something that, that just wasn't, wasn't there before. And I could go on and on about the things that have happened in the last six and a half years with the president we have now. I don't have time to go over that. But one person can affect the nation. Well, Rehoboam was affecting the nation of Israel in a good way for the first three years. But then something happened. Well, we know also one of the things that happened while he was, um, while he was taking charge that the nation of Israel split up. There were 12, 12 tribes and virtually under... Uh, under uh, the prior leadership, the prior kings, they had pretty much kept everyone together, walking together. But Rehoboam and his foolishness caused ten tribes to say, see you later, and they broke away. And so here we are in chapter number 12. It says in verse 1, It came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and strengthened himself, 
He forsook the word of the Lord. Now, in my Bible, it says law. Well, the law is the word. So I'll just say it's the word. He forsake God's word and all of Israel followed him. I got to tell you something. You and I have to be strong enough. We have to be willing to not follow the crowd if the crowd's going the wrong direction. And there's a lot of people walking like sheep going to slaughter because they're not following the ways of God. They're following man. And in this day, it's going to take courage to say, you know what, I'm not going that way. Hallelujah. And so it says here that all of Israel followed after him. Verse 2, it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, so three years he's followed God. After three years, he started drifting away from the word of God. And so year five shows up and Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Because they had transgressed against the Lord. So judgment was coming because of them forsaking God. And this, I'll just call him King Shack. Is that okay? King Shack, he had 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt. So they had the chariots, they had the horsemen, and they had an innumerable amount of walking soldiers. And they were gathered together to defeat Jerusalem and Israel. It says, verse 4, He took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah, and then he came to Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together because of Shak, King Shak, and said to them, Thus says the Lord, You've forsaken me, and therefore I have also left you. Doesn't the Bible say, If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you? Well, then the reverse is too. If we draw away from God, God has to draw away from us. It's not because He wants to. Because He cannot draw near to sin and rebellion. And so, the prophet spoke the word of the Lord to them. You've forsaken me, therefore I've left you in the hand of Shaq. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is is righteous. Well, I have to give them the fact that they recognized that God was right and they were sorrowful about it. You know, it could have got a big attitude. I don't care about King Shaq. We can, we, we can beat them. No. They recognized that they had drawn away from God. They pulled away from Him. And so, sometimes we don't understand how that God will use circumstances and situations and, situations and trouble that come in our lives to try to get us back to Him. The devil doesn't work for God. But God will use the pressure and things the devil brings to try to get us to wake up. Hey, we've drifted off. We've we've gone the wrong direction. We have backslidden. And God will use that pressure, use that difficulty, use that to call us back to Him. And so it says here, they humbled themselves before God. Verse 7, And when the Lord saw that they were humbled, 
the word of the Lord came to the prophet again, saying, They've humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them. You know what that tells me? It tells me if they hadn't humbled themselves, they would have all been wiped out. But God noticed they humbled themselves. And so the judgment was changed. The judgment was lessened. He said, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of King Shack. You know, i got to tell you something. I think America is right at this point in many respects. And we, the church, have a, a chance to call out to God and repent and to humble ourselves. So the judgment will not be as severe as it could be and really should be. And don't think that judgment cannot affect us. It can, to a degree, making things really difficult and miserable for us. And so God said, My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of King Shack. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdom of the countries. So, King Shack of Egypt came up against Jerusalem, and listen, listen what he did. And took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. And the treasures of the king's house, he took it all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Throughout the Bible, you will see that Egypt and specifically the kingdom, king of Egypt or the pharaohs are a representation of Satan. And we can see here Satan's most prized possession or his most prized target are the treasures of God in your heart. And he went after that treasure in the temple. He was after it. Why? Because those things were sanctified and separated to God. They were of great, great value. And if he could take those things out of the heart of Israel, he could, he could affect them spiritually in a great way. And of course, as, as we read, Israel then became servants of Egypt. Back in bondage again. Well, the devil is after the treasure in your heart. He's after it. That treasure is the Word of God. That treasure is faith in God. That treasure is revelation that he's after. He's after it. Well, I want us to look how Rehoboam responded to this. Not, well, and, and not only did he take the treasures of the house of the Lord, he took the treasures of the king as well. Verse 10 says, When the shields of gold that Solomon made had been taken, King Rehoboam made shields of brass. And committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard and kept the entrance of the king's house. There's significance in this. Have, have you ever seen brass? Brass is, I mean, it's shiny. What does it look like? It looks like gold, doesn't it? But it's not. It doesn't have the properties. It doesn't have the value. But it is an imitation. It's kind of like ladies when they find out they got ripped off because they got a fake Dooney Burke or, or whatever those purses are or, or Kochi or Coochie or whatever. I don't know. I mean, they have all these fancy names and, and what they, they, they copy them in China. You can't hardly tell the difference, you know. A $300 purse, you find it on sale for $75 somewhere, it's probably a fake. Huh? 
Praise the Lord. Well, these were fake. But they looked like the real thing. My friends, how many times have you and I had the treasure of God? We let the treasure go in our life. We chose other things and we substitute it with things that look like it. Oh, we, we look like we're spiritual on the outside. Huh? I, I mean, we, it, it looks good. But if that metal is put to the test, it will not pass. It will fail. You and I have been guilty of that. I, I, I mean, we on Sunday morning... Woo! Glory to God! We're we're praising the Lord! Hallelujah! Raising our hands! And during the week, oh my gosh, someone saw us and heard us in our home and in our car. They think, man, that's a heathen. Whoo! They're going to hell! Listen to how they talk. Listen how they act. Huh? I mean, we put the brass on when we come to church. Yeah. You know, I, I got to tell you something. This, this fake stuff needs to stop. Because it can cost us our lives. You know, that, that brass, brass is a soft metal, isn't it? Man. There could be a spear or something to go right through that shield. <laughs> Where the real thing, it wouldn't. So what he had done, what Rehoboam had done, is he had substituted brass for the real thing, for gold. And you know it's only under, it, it, it can look like it's gold, but it's only under fire you'll find out if it's the real thing. The devil is after God's treasure in you. i got to tell you this. He, he would prefer people don't get saved. He would prefer that. But you know, even after people are saved... He knows sometimes he can even do more damage to God and His kingdom through someone that claims to be a Christian. And they're not acting like it. They're living like the world. And so, know this, you and I are to protect our heart, the treasure of God in us, with all diligence. For out of our heart are the real issues of life. It's not so important about what's on the outside. Well, you remember Jesus dealing with the religious people. He said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look so clean and pretty on the outside. But on the inside, you're what? Dead man's bones. Just like dead man's bones. We're so concerned about what people think about us and not so concerned about what God thinks about us. I think we need to work on that. I know I do. Praise God. It's so easy to whitewash something. Instead of cleaning up what's on the inside. Hello. <laughs> yeah. I got a few more minutes. You know, since I've been here a long time, I mean on this planet, I've had a lot of opportunity to clean things, to repair things, to paint things. And I can honestly say the times that I haven't taken the time to do it right, I eventually regret it 
because it doesn't last. You know, if you don't prepare a surface to paint it, if you don't sand it or if you don't uh, make sure it's clean, it will bubble up or it will flake off or a, a something will happen after a very short period of time because it, you didn't do it right. And it's kind of like in our lives. We kind of do that with God. We just, we just take a spray can over the top of stuff. We just, oh, it looks good now. Oh, glory to God. And then life happens. And the cracks show up, the flakes show up, and it doesn't look so good anymore. No. If we get it right on the inside, deal with the, the real issues, praise God, then what's done on the outside will reflect what's on the inside. Praise the Lord. Now, Rehoboam, he was trying to save face and make it look like gold. He probably should have not done that. <laughs> he, he, he probably should have repented even more forcefully and trust God to return the treasures from Egypt. Now, I don't believe... They, they did not get the Ark of the Covenant. They were able to get hide that from them. But much of the rest of the treasures of God were taken. We need to value God's treasure in our life. So much so that we're not willing to fake it on the outside, but more focused on the inside. Amen. The church has been really guilty of this. We, we have to admit. You know, we're not perfect. But praise God, we're forgiven. We need to be real. We need to be approachable. We need to be at a place that people will not feel uncomfortable around us because we look down on them because they do this or they do that. You know, one thing that's outstanding, I'm, I'm wrapping things up. <laughs> one of the things that was outstanding about Jesus and His ministry as the sinners, the sinners did not feel uncomfortable in His presence. In fact, they were drawn to him. Yeah. Have you seen that when you read in the Gospels? The people that repelled against him were the religious people. But it says that the liars, the thieves, the prostitutes, all of these people were drawn to Jesus. I believe it's because they were drawn to the love. They were drawn to the presence of God. Because the presence of God, <laughs> amazing as it is, the presence of God will come on someone not in judgment, but in forgiveness, in restoration, in healing. That's what the presence of God will do. It's not to reject it. You're an old sinner and you don't deserve my presence. No. God invites everyone to come to Him. He will receive everyone. Hallelujah. Unto Himself. If they will just be drawn to Him. And when we're drawn into His presence, His presence is the thing that changes us. It causes that, that treasure to be built on the inside. 
that very treasure. That if we will hold on to it, praise God, it will change our entire life. Praise God for His presence. Would you stand up with me? I, I'll just keep talking if we don't. Praise the Lord. So my friends, I ask you a question. Is it brass or is it gold? What is the treasure in our heart? Have we allowed Satan to steal some treasure? Well, one thing I found out in the Bible, if the thief is caught, he has to return it. Even says even sevenfold. So if you or I have allowed the devil to steal some things, maybe he's stolen the joy of the Lord. Maybe he's stolen a desire for hearing and reading the Word of God. Maybe he, he's stolen... Uh, your peace, or whatever it is, you can get it back. You can get it back. For some people, I mean, really, they have lost the joy of salvation. I mean, they go to church out of duty, not out of joy, not out of excitement to hear from God. Amen. God will restore that treasure. Hallelujah. But we have to what? Take it back. How do we take things back from the devil? Oh, devil, would you please give me back my joy? No. No, the, the, the Bible says the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Meaning, you have to force the kingdom of darkness to give back what belongs to you. And you won't have that sort of unction to function without the Holy Ghost moving in you. And the Word of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what do you do? Spend time in the Word. Spend time in the Spirit. God will reveal to you the things that have been stolen. And He will, he will direct you in paths of righteousness. He will direct you on how to restore it all. Reminds me of the story when David came back from war and the whole town was taken. The wives and the children were taken. They were in Ziklag. Their homes were burning. He didn't pull out his hair. He didn't cry in his soup. What did he do? He called upon God. God, God, what do I need to do about this? Lord, help me, direct me. And what did God say? He said, you get up from that place and you go and recover all. You go get it. You go get your family. Some of you have some family that's run off from God. Go get him in the spirit. Get him restored. Some of you got some ugly family members or ugly people you work with. I mean, acting ugly, okay? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, they're just nasty. Some of you just need to go before God. Oh, God, have mercy on that soul. God, there's things in their life that have caused them to be bitter and angry and, and all these things. Oh, God, move in their life. Isn't that so much better than cursing them? Hallelujah. Like I said, the treasures that Satan has stolen is worth the effort to go get. It's so much better than using brass to make everyone think everything's okay. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that your Spirit has had opportunity to speak to our hearts today. Lord God, our lives are not hidden from you. Everything is made manifest. You know our even thoughts and intents of our heart. Father, you know whether we are seeking your kingdom first. Lord, you know whether we're really saved or not. There's so many people that attend church and they're, they've not really given their life to God. They've not really surrendered. So, Father, as we pray before you today, 
Lord, may we not be like Rehoboam, substituting brass for gold. But Lord, we would only be satisfied with the true and what is right in our lives. Lord God, I believe for a righteous spirit to rise up to go get the things that Satan has stolen from us. Father God, may we value your kingdom first and your righteousness. Lord God, may we make these things a priority instead of these natural carnal things which will pass away. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Now before we go, I don't know people's hearts. I cannot see into your spirit realm unless the Lord would reveal that sort of thing. And you watching by the internet, I can't look through the computer at you and tell whether you're saved. I don't see a cross on your forehead (laughs) or, or any such thing. But God does. And God's looking at hearts. The Bible says... That Jesus loved us so much. And our God the Father loved us so much that Jesus came to this earth to die in our place. And those that believe and receive Him will be saved and won't be condemned with those that reject Him. There's only one way to salvation and that's Jesus Christ. Another thing that I know is that I don't know where you will be an hour from now, a day from now, a week from now, or months from now. I don't know where you'll be. I don't know what things will go on. There could be people standing amongst us today that won't be here tomorrow. Something could happen. I know of some people, they say, well, I'll get serious about God when I'm 80 years old. Some of those people didn't make it. They put off getting serious with God. And they missed God for eternity. God's will for all mankind is that they be saved, that they make heaven. The Bible says very clearly that the will of God is that all men be saved. That's the will of God. But He does not force that on any of us. It's our choice. Today I'm going to give you an opportunity to make the choice to receive Jesus. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you want to today, would you raise your hand because I want to pray with you. Anybody here? Say, I need Jesus in my life. Anybody here? If you're watching by the internet, raise your hand right where you're at. If you need Jesus because... I'm going to pray for you and pray with you. Praise God. One more thing before we pray. Is there anyone here to say, Pastor, Yeah, I've received Jesus as my Lord, but, you know, I just have not been serving Him. I've been guilty of substituting brass for gold, and and I need to get things right. I can pray with you as well. Anyone here say, Pastor, I I need to re- we dedicate my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Anybody else? Praise God. Thank you. Anybody else? Just raise up your hand. You're, you're doing this before God, not before man. God's looking at your heart. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. First, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to, to pray out loud with me. Father God, you've, you look on the hearts of people. Everyone here right now at this moment or people that will be watching this message in the future. Lord, you know what is true and what is right. Lord, you know those that have not surrendered yet to Jesus. And you know those, Lord, that need to get back on the straight and narrow way. So, Lord, I believe as we pray together and agree that these words of confession will bring possession in life. 
In Romans it declares that if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and confess Him as our Lord and Savior, we shall be saved. So Lord, that's how we're going to pray right now. So if you made the decision to receive Jesus for the first time or you're rededicating your life to the Lord, or if you're agreeing with those that do, please pray out loud with me right now. Dear God in heaven, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I confess Him as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I give you my life. Use me for your kingdom. Thank you for delivering me from the power of darkness and giving me the joy of salvation. I commit to serve you all the days of my life. I will not substitute brass for gold. I will accept the real in my life. And Jesus, you are real. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that, you, you were speaking to God. He was listening to your heart. He was listening to your prayer. Now the Holy Spirit has come to lead you and direct you and instruct you in the way that you're to go. He will speak to your heart. There's maybe some adjustments that need to be made. Maybe some changes here. But He will lead you to life. Amen. Amen. Father, we rejoice over these decisions today. We honor and glorify You. And Father, as we leave this place, we're not dismissed from Your presence. For You go with us. Thank you, Lord. May our lives be a reflection of you and your goodness everywhere we go. Father, may we be on guard because we know the evil one goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, seeking, Lord, the treasures of God in our life. We will not let him have them. We will not... In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, God spoke to our hearts today. Amen. Let's hold on to it. Let's don't be like the seed that's sown on the byway and the birds come and immediately take it away. Let's hold it in good ground. Amen. Amen. God bless. We are dismissed.